I can tell you Jeremiah did go to Ireland, and I can prove that. And I'll even show you what his name was in Ireland. I can tell you that the sons of the daughters of King Zedekiah ended up in Ireland as well, just not as we have the story told to us. Because once more, as we start to pick this apart, the holes that are found, the problem with Irish history in general, it's, there's a lot of this what I'd call half-truths combined with some myths, combined with some other things. You've got to do a lot of sorting. <laughs> We are still in the series on the Lost Tribes. I believe this would be message number 25 today. But before I begin my message, I have something very important to share with you regarding this teaching. Every single message I present here, and specifically, if there isn't any message that I don't do this to, but specifically these messages, I have been very careful to use reference material that is um, traceable, reference material that has basically stood the test of time, not some gimmicky stuff. And I think I shared this with you. I learned this lesson many years ago. Unfortunately, it was a, a double-edged sword, the, le the lesson that I learned. But, um, even the best teachers can make mistakes. And I, early on in taking over the ministry, had some rather unusual dilemmas. And I'm just going to be blunt honest with you. Dr. Scott's scholarship, in my opinion, was unmatched. As I began to do more in-depth studies, research, specifically on the linguistic side. I encountered some glitches which made it very awkward for me. I can speak about this now. Enough time has passed. No one's going to look at me crazy. But today I have uh, a big problem because many of you who have sat for decades listening to teaching, what I'm about to say, what I'm about to share will jar some of you. Not that it's the end result will be the same, but what's in the middle is important. And I've said to you many times when I say, go check me out. You ever heard me say that? Yes. That's because I know when I'm presenting something, I say, go check me out. I have verified the source. I have looked at the material. I've scrutinized. I have looked diligently or with due diligence to have the confidence to say, you go check it out. It'll, con it'll be confirmed. I'm not worried. This is the same thing today. It will be confirmed. I'm not worried. But it will sound slightly different. And um, when I say to you the materials that I use, um, and I've made a small list of them here that are what I would call the absolutes, especially on the subject for the lost tribes, for the tribe of Judah, and specifically on this message, um, I've said to you, Equally, if I found something different than what I had even previously said, I would bring it to you because there's no room for pride or ego. So again, I'm trying to kind of plant the seed that what I'm about to unfold may sound a little different, but I have proof to back up what I'm saying. Um, some of the subject matter that I'm going to be referencing, I will bring next week in more of a chart form laid out more visually so you can see it. Uh, but much of the material that I have pulled from uh, belongs to the Annals of the Kingdom of Ireland by the Four Masters, which I highly doubt anyone's going to look at that and scrutinize it. It's so old. O'Flaherty's Ogegia, The Chronicles of the Scots by Hector Boyce, the works of Colonel McAnoy's, Geoffrey Keating's History, etc. These are all uh, substantive works that have stood the test of time. However, here's my great dilemma. Uh, sometimes you do research and you find out that maybe the bulk of what you're going to Google has just been merely regurgitated. Somebody found something, and I, I had to go through this exercise. So I'm explaining this to you. 
As I began the work, this is part two on the message of the tribe of Judah. We were talking about Jeremiah, the daughters of Zedekiah. And the thing that leaped out at me is that I cannot just avoid this subject. I have to flush out the information. So that started a process of looking at where did this misinformation come from? Where have we got this information that most of us who are familiar with this material or it's in our mind, walk around with. So I went back to trace it, and I'm going to mention all this in my message today. Um, but I'm kind of just preparing you in advance, because I know in times past I have presented things, and I've heard this is the most irritating thing I could. I'm just going to tell you. It's the most irritating thing. Well, Dr. Scott didn't say that. You didn't teach that. Listen, the man was a genius, but he didn't know everything and neither do I. And as we progress, we learn. We know more now, for example, technologically. Let's say when he was alive, the concept of DNA study was in, in its infancy and has taken on dramatic changes with technology that has led us to the most minute details of the ability to go down to such great detail that wasn't there. Carbon dating is the same thing when we started this. If you remember, decades ago, for example, the Shroud of Turin, people vacillated. Oh, it's just a mere, after all this time, carbon-14 dating said it's just a forgery and it's a late production until better technology now has analyzed the cloth. So when I say to you, things are constantly changing, we, as a body of learners, need to be that open-minded too, that if new things come up, we shouldn't reject them, like I just mentioned Christmas. We shouldn't reject if some fact comes up that we're able to substantiate that we reject something because, well, it's my baggage, it's my pet theory, it's something I've believed my whole life. So I'm asking for maturity today, for those people who hold certain things and rah, I'm also asking for you to go check me out afterwards. Because when you see it sometimes with your own eyes, you can then go, wow, eh, OK, unfortunately, but. So here we go. We are still studying the tribe of Judah. And as I, I'm going to do a very brief recap, almost not, none probably here, just a little snippet. But Judah is one of the children of the patriarch Jacob Israel, and like all of the children of Jacob Israel, now I'm going to call him just Israel, so the children of Israel, they all had descendants. They made it and they had descendants. And I've referenced this, the uh, incredible passage in the Bible that talks about Judah and Tamar uh, and their interesting union along the way, uh, which is always very interesting. But that union produced, eventually produces uh, the children, Faraz and Zara, from that line. And I've briefly touched on this because that line basically bifurcates. So if you're reading the genealogies that lead down to Christ, you would be reading about Faraz. But the Zara branch of the Judah line kind of disappears very early on, and I covered this in other messages. We trace the migration of Chalcol or Calcol, and basically followed these lines to personages like Brutus and the Malaysian kings in Ireland. So we are looking at uh, the line that descends from Judah. And the first thing I want us to look at, because I didn't reference this, is the blessing that Jacob, Israel, gives to Judah. So if you will turn with me to Genesis 49, and not that this, that this will be instrumental in any way, shape, or form uh, for this message. Just to read this and to understand, there are two takeaways that are very, very clear. So beginning Genesis 49, verses 8 through 12, with an emphasis on verse 10. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. And if you were reading this in the Hebrew, you would see that praise and Judah look very much the same in the Hebrew. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. 
Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey, my son. Thou art gone up, he stooped down, he couched as a lion and as an old lion. Who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh, that is Christ, come. And unto, unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So it goes on, but I'm just going to, the most specific thing to take away there is the scepter shall not depart from Judah. That is the right to rule. The scepter belongs to a king or a queen and lawgiver. So think of that, ruling and reigning and the giving of the law or, or law, let's say giving of law and law enforcement for that matter. So the reason why I bring this out is because we know that according to the promises equally repeated to Jeremiah, God, the Lord God said to Jeremiah that basically there will never be a time when the seed of David, when there's not a seed of David sitting on the throne somewhere in the world. And so with all of that, we started looking at, we'll call it the end of the line of Judah in terms of the kingdom, the kingdom that is now divided. If you remember, we talked about this at the death of Solomon, the kingdom divides into north and south. We've been dealing for most of these messages with the northern kingdom. Basically, the bulk of those people have now gone, they're migrated, they've moved on. We have the southern kingdom that will be deported to Babylon, Babylonian captivity, which was prophesied. You read about it in the book of Daniel and in some parts of the Psalms and other places for 70 years. When the time was fulfilled, the 70 years ran, the people were basically given by the king a decree that they could return. And as I've referenced this many times, a very small group of people, if you think about the mass multitude of the tribe of Judah and the smaller group of people or tribes that would have been with them, it's a small sliver that returns. Less than 50,000 come back. We read about those people in the books of Nehemiah, Ezra, etc. So we pick up here, at, we'll call it the line that is the end of the kings of Judah before the fall uh, of Jerusalem, um, the reign of the kings of Judah. So if you remember, I was talking to you about Zedekiah and how what they did to him. Basically, they took him, and he has to witness his sons being murdered in front of him. Then they took out his eyes, and they led him away to prison, and there he goes to rot until he dies in prison. In the meantime, where we left off last week is the prophet Jeremiah has the daughters of the king, and they flee to Egypt. Now, all of that is kind of the recap, a little bit in a nutshell of last week, but I want to point out something that is very easily overlooked. So please turn with me to 2 Kings 24. This is where you got to kind of pay attention to the small details. 2 Kings 24. And I'll begin at verse 8. Because this is before Zedekiah, but it, it'll explain something. Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned in Jerusalem three months. And his mother's name was Nehushta, the daughter of El Nathan of Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father had done. At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city, and his servants did besiege it. Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, went out to the king of Babylon, he and his mother and his servants and his princes, his officers, and the king of Babylon took him in the eighth year of his reign. He carried out thence all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and cut in pieces all the vessels of gold which Solomon, king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Lord, as the Lord had said. And he carried away all Jerusalem, all the princes, all the mighty men of valor, even 10,000 captives and all the craftsmen and smiths. None remained save the poorest sort of people of the land. And he carried away Jehoiakim to Babylon and the king's mother and the king's wives and his officers and the mighty of the land, those carried he into captivity from Jerusalem to Babylon. 
and all the men of might, even 7,000, and craftsmen, smiths a thousand that were strong and apt for war, even them the king of Babylon brought captive to Babylon. Here's what I want you to pay attention to. And the king of Babylon made Mataniah, his father's brother, king in his stead and changed his name to Zedekiah. So there's something important there. And what's important is it's telling you that although, we'll say the last king, doesn't matter if he did evil or whatnot, but the last king technically in the, in the line of, proper line of succession was Jehoiakim, not Zedekiah. Zedekiah was appointed by Nebuchadnezzar. Just, I want you to think about that. It wasn't, now God could have used Nebuchadnezzar to appoint him, but I don't, actually in this case, I don't think that's the case. So you say, what are you saying here? Well, I'm saying he's still relative, so his bloodline still matters. But what we don't have information about here, and I want you to just put this in your cap right now, we don't have information about Jehoiakim, nor his wives, and it makes no statement here of any children. But it's safe to say that when people married and had wives, they had wives for a purpose that was usually to produce children. So even though there are no children mentioned here, there's a very good probability that Jehoiakim, his mother, his wives, officers, mighty men, and probably children were carried off to Babylon. And this is why I'm saying don't lose track of the small details that seem to fade away we know nothing about what happened to them. They could have died in captivity in Babylon. But just remember, if there were children, then there probably were children who had children and so forth. So the line, the end of the line, the end of this final line, we have no ability to trace the descendants of Jeconiah, or Jehoiakim, sorry. We can trace Zedekiah, and we know that the sons were killed, and we know that the daughters are entrusted to Jeremiah. So I want you to keep in mind something which may remain a mystery for us. We may never find this out. But the fact is that there are descendants that were taken into captivity. And by the way, it just says they were led into captivity. It doesn't say that they threw them into a prison and let them rot there. So the whereabouts of these, this offspring leaves us with a big question mark. And these technically would be the rightful descendants, bloodline, if you will, descending in that line of Judah. So sometimes what I'm saying here is sometimes we have answers and sometimes we don't. We don't have answers on that, but we do have answers regarding uh, Zedekiah. So we know that Zedekiah was only 32 years old when he witnessed his sons killed in front of his eyes. That's a pretty young age. That tells you, again, I'm trying to piece something together. If he was 32, and it doesn't really give us an indication of how old his sons were, but we can know certain things. We can know that the daughters, the sons and the daughters, would have been in the same age range. And obviously, it's a no-brainer to say that they couldn't have been older than a certain age if he was only 32 when this event happened. So figure that. Um, you can kind of say these children of Zedekiah couldn't have been that old. We tend to read this and sometimes think, oh, they must have been grown men. But Zedekiah was only 32. So another food for thought idea here, okay? One last thing I want you to look at with me, and that is the record in Matthew's Gospel. Please turn with me to Matthew 1.1, 1, 1. first chapter of Matthew. And... If you're reading through the whole genealogy, I want you to pay close attention to something. I'm just going to jump in here. It says, And Josias begat Jeconias, his brethren, about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And if you keep reading, you're not going to find the mention of Zedekiah. The last mention here is Jeconias. And, and I'm saying to you, the writer, when Matthew was writing, there sure had to be an understanding about something that we totally gloss over. That's why I pointed out he was appointed by Nebuchadnezzar, and he's a removed relative. He's not in the direct line, even though he's still bloodline, which is why I believe he's not actually listed in the genealogy. Just 
a little thought right there. But the terminus, I want you to look at the terminus of this. The terminus of this ends in verse 16, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So in this list, Christ is the terminus. And that's not difficult to understand, but if we're going to go with what was promised, that a seed or descendant of David will always be sitting on the throne, well, yes, Jesus technically is sitting on the throne, and he ever liveth to make intercession for us. But we're talking about in the flesh until he returns. So that's what we're going to look into in a second, or maybe we won't get to it today, but we're definitely going to investigate that to probe through and see what we can find. Now, I put these pieces of information more to be thought-provoking than anything else. They're not going to add or subtract to the message. But if you have read or at least combed through the book of Jeremiah or studied it, uh, I'm now getting into where I dropped off last week, you know that he was a prophet during the times which we're looking at. And uh, we learn a tremendous amount from studying the book that bears his name. If we were going to engage in this, I'd say, just for your records, if you can, if you can find Jeremiah, turn to and look at, if you have a Bible like mine, which is helpful sometimes, even though I don't like the headers, the bold type headers, but if you have a Bible like mine, chapter 37, Jeremiah is put in prison. And even when Jeremiah is in prison, we read that Zedekiah, King Zedekiah, inquired of the prophet. Eventually, we know Jeremiah is released from prison and involved in this unfolding drama. If we comb the scriptures, especially in Jeremiah, and I'm, I'm really encouraging you in your own time to read through certain parts of Jeremiah, keep in mind the book is not in order. It's not in chronological order. So a lot of people read it and they get confused and they give up because it's not in order. But if you know what you're looking for, you'll be able to piece together a lot of information concerning Jeremiah at this particular time. Now there's something in addition to what I just said to you. As I said, 37 shows that he was put in prison. We read the subsequent chapters to find out he's released. And a little bit later on in the 41st chapter, I believe we're reading about he basically goes to uh, Gedalia in Mizpah, and it's not said there, but it's implied he's basically going to become the protector or the guardian of the daughters of the king. We do know that. That is uh, an absolute truth. But in between all this, I was wondering, could we find any more information on the subject of Zedekiah that would be enlightening to us? And actually, there is a passage you don't have to turn there. I'm realizing sometimes people get irritated by having to turn pages so much. So I'll just read to you um, in Ezekiel 21 and verse 27. Well, actually, it's a little bit before that. How about I'll jump in here and read this to you, uh, starting at verse 24. Therefore, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because you have made your iniquity to be remembered, in that your transgressions are discovered, so that in all your doings your sins do appear... Because I say that you are come to remembrance, you shall be taken with the hand. And thou profane wicked prince of Israel, this is reference to Zedekiah, whose day is come when iniquity shall have an end. Thus saith the Lord God, remove the diadem, this crown, take off the crown. This shall not be the same. Exalt him that is low, abase him that is high. And the key to this verse is the verse 27. The English reads, I will overturn, overturn, overturn it, and it shall be no more until he who comes, whose right it is, and I will give it to him. But if you read carefully, and if you have a Bible like mine, in that 27th verse where it says overturn, 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 the margin says perverted, perverted, perverted. So it's referencing Zedekiah. That, again, the problem a lot of times is we study and we get so used to the English, overturn, overturn, and we think it means something else. But actually, it's referencing the perversion that the king himself created amongst the people. And this comes from a long line. Basically, there were very few kings that didn't uh, infect the populace. Okay, So 
With the end of Zedekiah's reign, and as I said, his sons are slaughtered before his eyes, and we, as I said, mentioned the passage out of Jeremiah 41 that mentions Zedekiah going to uh, ask basically for the guardianship or protectorship. It's implied. We know that they went to Egypt. You'd find that in Jeremiah 43. So here's the big question. We have all of us who have looked at this material before have walked around with a tradition. One that Jeremiah took the daughters of Zedekiah to Ireland. We've walked around with that. How many here know that already? Okay. And then there's this other problem. He went with his scribe. The scribe's name is Baruch or Simon Baruch. And we know that they all traveled together. Here's the problem. Here's where my problem begins. Most of us who have read material know that Jeremiah has been identified by an Irish name, right? Olam Fola. Or if you're going to pronounce the letters that are not supposed to be pronounced, Fodla, right? Olem Fodla. How many have heard that? Okay. So here's the big problem. The big problem is purportedly his tomb is on the island of Devonish, not far from Ennis Killin. And the story goes that Olem Fola presented one of the king's daughters, uh, Tamar or Tia Tephi, to Haramon. And they were married at Terra sometime around 580 BC. There's only one big problem with that. Next week, I will bring better proof. But I printed this out off of a website because it was the quickest thing I could do before trying to engage in writing something copious for you. I want you to take a look at something. Take a look at where the top of my pen is right here. You see the name? Olem, or Ola Fola, or Olem Fola. Take a look at the date, 1317 BC. Big problem, friends. You know what the big problem is? Jeremiah lived about 500, well, we know the fall of Jerusalem occurred in 586 BC. This says 1317 BC. Big problem, because that means it doesn't add up. Well. I started looking at the Annals of the Four Masters. Uh, I, I researched every old extant material. And they all line up with this date. So then I began to be quite perplexed. I asked myself, how could so many, if you Google this, not this, but if you Google the subject, you're going to find websites after websites after websites that this person, Olem Fola, is Jeremiah. You're going to find website after website. The problem is, if you're going to the oldest extant material, they all, and there's a sliding date, but they all have it basically. The problem is, we're looking at a man who reigned for 40 years in Ireland, who was a warrior, who bore sons, and his, the name of his sons are listed, who is also listed as pagan in all of these records, OK? Wrong time. And I, you know, I vacillated. I, I was thinking to myself, you know, I could just drop the subject, because there's so many people here who have been taught this. Or I can present the material, and I can say what I have always said. Go check me out. So if you have the time or the inclination, simply Google. Not, not, not that it means that everything that comes up on Google is going to be accurate, but simply Google the timeline for Olam Fola. Now, there are websites, and I'm, I'm going to tell you how this happened even. A lot of this is traceable. I can actually tell you many of the sources of this. And it's not modern, as you might think. If you study the records of the kings, the History of Ireland from Thomas More that dates back this particular publication that I'm looking at to 1846, or any solid record, the chronicle that you encounter of the kings of Ireland, you will find this description. Olam Fola, or Olav Fola, lived about 900 years. This is, I'm 
a homogenization of all the material that I read about 900 years before Jeremiah's time. Olam was the son of King Fiach of Ireland, and we know that when you read the Bible, we know that Jeremiah was, and it tells you where Jeremiah is from. In fact, just for the folks who are not clear on this subject, uh, the opening, we know where he comes from. We know where Jeremiah comes from. He comes from Anathoth, if you remember that. And let me go to the beginning for folks who are not well versed on this. Very opening verses of Jeremiah. Um, it basically, if you, Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, tells you who he's son of. So here we have Olam was the son of King Fiach, F-I-A-C-H, of Ireland, born and raised there. All of these Irish records and all of the chronicles subsequently all say the same thing. He was born and raised in this land, lived his entire life in Ireland, ruling as a king for 40 years, known in the records as the 21st Milesian king who founded a place of learning at Terra. Now you might say, well, could there not be a convergence of things? Or, you know, in desperation, by the way, just so you know, in desperation, I was desperate to try and find something that could be some kernel of things that I myself knew that I'd been programmed with, right? Second problem in this is if we want to continue perpetuating the story, that's not to say that Jeremiah didn't go to Ireland because he did, just not at the, the, the times do not match up. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you all of this. It's very, you can document all of this. But the scribe, that went with him. Oh, his name's definitely Baruch. Here's the problem, though. When people say, well, it's in, it's in the records. You can find him in the records. Oh, you can find him in the records. There is a Simeon Brach, a Malaysian, who basically was a king 400 years before Christ and a grandson of a man named, I hope I get this right, named Hid. And we've crossed this name before in other studies. So in the historical records, Olem Fola has no association with Simon or Simeon Brach. They lived at different times. That's not to say the Bible record is not true. It's simply to say that there's been such a conflation of information. Then there's one more. Uh, there's a woman bearing the name of Tefi or Tefi. She was married to Canthon, a British king that had no relation to the royal line of Ireland in any way. So what do we do with this? Because we've all heard the story of Tia Tefai. And if you believe the story, there's another story that there were two daughters. One is named Skoda that was adopted by the pharaoh of Egypt and given the name Skoda. And the other one, Tia Tefai. Well, let me enlighten you and please I want you to write this down because I want you to check this out for yourself. A man named F.R.A. Glover who was uh, we'll call him some form of a clergy fancied himself a little bit of a story and definitely dabbled in Brit uh, British uh, Israelitism if you want to call it that but was most likely writing for Queen Victoria in the 1800s uh, it's very clear that the road of Tia Tefai leads back to him. He is the first one, I'm, trust me when I say I dug for this, he is the first one in his writings where it appears that he took these two names and glued them together and begins to propagate a story that will be basically, this is, this is my problem, it's a curse and a blessing because I like to dig and I like to research. Once I start on something, I have to go through with it. I have to follow it all the way. So you start with him who propagated the Tia Tefai, and you go all the way down to the world, uh, Herbert Armstrong, Worldwide Church of God, and many others, including a man that I have held in high regard, still high, hold in high regard, he's deceased, but uh, the late Dr. Capt. Um, who also propagated the same thing. And here's, here's the tragedy. So this is what happens when you're doing research. You're going to find things that don't mesh. 
And somebody might say, well, maybe your information's off, but here's my problem. My information's coming from the oldest sources that are untainted by some idea to try and make things fit perfectly or to try and have an agenda. And I have no agenda here. My agenda is to present the truth and you do whatever you want with it. So when I say, go check me out, please go check me out, but don't do this stupid thing of going to the website, going to the internet and Googling Tia Tefai because you're gonna find a bazillion websites that have just basically engaged in regurgitation. They have taken information that was propagated since the 1800s. It's misinformation and it is definitely misinformation for a fact. And I, can, I will prove this next week. I will, I will bring documentation to show you. So, I say, well, uh, can I make matters worse for you? <laughs> you know how many people in the Bible are named Jeremiah? Eight. Eight that I could find. So here's what's interesting. If you read some of these materials that have been printed and are in circulation, some of these materials say that Jeremiah was actually the grandfather of, or in some way related to the daughters of the king. Now hold that thought for a second. Why do I introduce this? Because we know for a fact, I just opened up the book here, Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah. We know who Jeremiah is. We know he's called of God. Yet there are other Jeremiahs. There is a Jeremiah of Libna, the father of Hamutal, the wife of Josiah, who, who mothered Zedekiah. And there is your point of confusion right there. This is a completely different Jeremiah of Libna is not Jeremiah of Hilkiah, the son of Hilkiah. They're not the same people. They're two different people. But somebody's taken this information, so you'll read that Jeremiah somehow was related to these daughters, and he was not. Sorry. It's just the way it is. And again, if, if people have a problem with this, then you have a problem with the truth. You know, it's, it was hard for me, but then I said, no, I'm going to just do this, and I'm going to leave it in the hands of my very intelligent listening audience to figure this out and do your own research. There's another Jeremiah. As I said, there are eight in total. So you can see that there's uh, another Jeremiah that is in, mentioned in Nehemiah 10 and Nehemiah 12. There's another Jeremiah of... Um, the tribe of Manasseh. There is Jeremiah a Benjamite in 1 Chronicles 12. And uh, there's even within the book of Jeremiah, there is one mentioned out of the house of the Rechabites. There's a lot of Jeremiah. So somebody who didn't take the time to, to pick this apart properly conflates two different Jeremiahs painting him as some relative. Now, I'm not saying that it's in possible, but the record is quite distinct. So let's kind of put that there for a second. Next, there's a poem that appears in the book of Leinster. And so you're saying, what the heck is that? Well, this is not the book of Leinster, but to give you an idea, this is a map, an ancient map of Ireland. And if you look carefully, there's Leinster right there. So the book obviously came from, heralded from here. And I will try and, as I say, bring documentation next week to show you exactly what I'm referencing. But there was a poem. And this is what the poem describes of Olam Fola. <clears throat> Olam Fola, of furious valor, who founded the court of Olam, was the first heroic king that instituted the Feast of Timin. Forty sweet musical years he held the high sovereignty of Erin, Ireland. And it was from him with noble pride the Oltonians took their name. Six kings of valiant career of Olam's race reigned over Erin for 210 full years. No, uh, no other person came between them. Six sons reigned after him, beginning with his son, I hope I say this right, Finchiara, followed by Slanolel, Giddy, etc. Some of these names are really hard for me to read. My question is, first, who then was this Olem Fola? Next, and again, the question begs, how can this be, right? Let me pause right there. So you, I just showed you a list 
I quickly printed from the internet. This is one of many, but this is a long, long list of the kings. And basically what it helps us to understand is that not only does the timeline not match up, I'm actually looking at the names of the sons right here, not only do the names not match up, but if we're trying to figure this out, I think that I have more than once talked about perhaps how old the approximate age of Jeremiah, even his age, if, if we were to even imagine that it's possible to put him back at that date, which it's not. As a man of valor and in other records described as pagan, but where did these six sons come from? So this may be something that for some people say, well, that's kind of hard for me to accept that. Well, I can tell you Jeremiah did go to Ireland, and I can prove that. And I'll even show you what his name was in Ireland. I can tell you that the sons of the daughters of King Zedekiah ended up in Ireland as well, just not as we have the story told to us. Because once more, as we start to pick this apart, the holes that are found, the problem with Irish history in general, it's, there's a lot of this what I'd call half-truths combined with some myths, combined with some other things. You've got to do a lot of sorting. But when you go back to these records, as I'm referencing the, uh, specifically the Annals of the Four Masters, um, the record of the Malaysian kings, you will know that the timeline doesn't add up. In fact, I'll just put it out there. The timeline would be more in concert with King David. Just a thought. I'm not saying, okay? But I'm just putting it out there that the timeline just doesn't match up if we were going to try and fit this nicely into a box. And this is my grievance. My grievance is that, unfortunately, when I read books, I can tell where the material's been regurgitated from. That's a blessing and a curse. So as I said, as I traced all this back, I thought, wait a minute. This is all too, way too convenient. But this really kind of burst my bubble because for decades, I've just naturally gone along with this narrative that all of you have accepted. So does it change anything about the outcome? Well, I think you're going to see the answer is no. They still, as I said, they still went to Ireland. I'll show you where he is in the records. I'll show you actually where the daughters are in the records. I will actually show you that there was a union. And, of course, if you're looking for the information properly, it's as clear as day. So just uh, let's move on to the next thought because there's a lot more to be said. So with all of that, Somebody might say, well, what's, what's the big deal here? Well, the big deal is this. Um, somebody took it upon themselves to kind of revise or conflate or imagine. But the reality is, yes, there is the truth of how we understand Jeremiah. Uh, OK, I'll, you want spoiler alert? Spoiler alert? Yeah. Not sure you're ready for this. But some of you will go probably jump ahead and try and find the answers out anyway. So I might as well. Jeremiah actually appears in the Irish records as a man named Yorabel or Yarabel. Follow me. Jeremiah, J, does not exist in Hebrew, but Ya, Yo, does, right? So you've got his first name, Yar, E, and it's Ebel, El. He's basically Yar, son of God. And he appears in the Irish records as a prophet. And it is in exactly the same time, essentially, that it would have taken from the time that they left Egypt to arrive in Ireland. And yes, did they make a direct? You can't make a direct line. It's like, oh, I will take the direct donkey flight. <laughs> to. They had to pass through places, as I've more than once described to you, which tells you that on their way, it is more than likely that they stopped along the way in Spain. And that piece of information will become crucial in when we are compiling the rest of this to show you exactly how. 
Um, the other thing that I want to point out, which I think is incredibly important, is if you're going to do research, take the time to, if you can find, it, it is online. So the Annals of the Four Masters, O'Flaherty's Ogegia, uh, O-G-Y-G-I-A, I think it's spelled. Look these things up. It takes, it's a lot of, um, it's a lot of hard reading because you've got to kind of go through pages upon pages. Um, the record that I mentioned, I'm not exactly sure when it was first published, but Thomas More's record, The History of Ireland, look into that. If you can find a copy, which is now in the public domain, I believe, of uh, Clano McAnoy's, which basically is the chronicle of Ireland, and within there, there's a, a good mix, and the author basically separates what is perceived mythology versus reality. So if you go to these sources, which are the oldest extant sources that we can find, you'll find it corroborates what I'm saying. And unfortunately, we have the, the popularity, as I said, of the Worldwide Church of God's material that circulated, that even this ministry for decades basically picked up and just you automatically can assume, uh, well, they're putting it out there, it must be so. And as I said, you know, Part of my brain works on research and digging, and there was something that didn't add up immediately when I was trying to find out, okay, let's look more into this Olam personage and let's see what the records say about him. That's when I discovered the date, the time that he lived, the time that he reigned, his six sons. Um, there's a, actually a lot more information about him, including the fact, as I said, that he was pagan. So when we'd like to attribute and make this into a nice package, it, it just doesn't fit. And as I said, I've just given you some references to go and check out. But I guarantee you there'll be people who have not heard any of the references that I've given. They will go and they will look up and they will say, well, there's plenty of material here that says Tia Tefai, that says da 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 da. You're looking at the regurgitation. We'll call it the remnants of regurgitation because there's a lot of pieces out there and people who have taken embellished change. So I'm warning you. But I'm also telling you, if you even dare to look up in the records which are out there of the Malaysian kings, that is, again, you look into that, this is actually what this list is. This is a list of the kings that ruled. And again, the timeline is confirmed. So I think I've, I've said enough there to try and make sense of this. But why does all this matter? Well, first thing I want you to know, first thing that it should reveal to you is, um, a little switch for me is I'd rather stand here and tell you the truth and be clear about it and give you my sources and, and have you look it up than avoid the subject and keep perpetuating what is a blatant error, which even some of the best scholars just went along with because it, it sounds so plausible, right? Um, second thing I want you to know is that this was at, at the beginning when I encountered this was a little bit like a difficult call because I realize I have some people out there that are, I've said certain things in the past that get very dogmatic and they get mad at me and then they pout because they don't like what I've said. Well, if you don't like the truth, don't listen to me. How's that? That's pretty simple, isn't it? Yeah. So um, next in, in terms of what I want to unfold here, probably I may have to dip into this a little bit more next week, but what I want to unfold here is something really important. It's a lesson for you, actually, that's not necessarily right out of this subject, but it's, it's showing you something. Anybody can put information out there. And a lot of times I people say, or people have sent me, it's their hard work, binders of their own research, and I, I appreciate it. But just recognize something. It's like we take for granted the information that's out there. You Google something, you automatically assume, well, if it's out there, you know, people still trust Wikipedia. Hello, right? Uh, I've said to you many times, if you're going to do some studies, there's, there are at least three steps. And I'm actually saying this now for the benefit of my listening audience. There are three steps you should take if you're looking for reference material. First. Going to the oldest source doesn't mean it's going to be correct. So, but you do look for the oldest source that we have. Second, you look for corroborating sources that are 
written by obviously different authors, and usually you try and research if the authors are coming from different places. So in my case, I went to look for history of kings, I went to look for the history of Ireland, but then I also went on the backside more of an ethnological approach. So as long as you're looking at this from different foci to get your information, and when you compile all, all that information from these different, we'll call it different angles, you're not looking at somebody who's just, I'm just a preacher out there and I'm going to keep looking at all the preachers, or just a historian, I'm gonna look at all the historians. You need multiple sources writing from different vantage points, then you can put the, inf you can compile the information, and the information, by the way, if it agrees, coming from all of these different sources from different angles, I would say, is substantial and could be even considered something that you could rely on. Then you take the next step. So the next step would be conferring with older, not modern, sorry, not modern dictionaries, not modern encyclopedias, especially now I'm, I'm seeing a lot of dictionaries now are changing to uh, woke terminology. So things that you thought you could count on like a dictionary, and I wanted to use an explicative before I said dictionary. <laughs> Lord forgive me, are no longer trustworthy. But if you go to older sources, older material, so you're looking at dictionaries, religious encyclopedias, anything that basically, I hate to say this, it has to be older, predated preferably before 1800. So we're looking at there was a genuine interest to contribute into society knowledge without any bias or corruption back then. So I'm using a lot of old sources. But then I went to something very unusual. I actually tried to go through an archeological or even um, anything that could help me. And I found several sources there to back up again what I found on these other sides. So you put all that information together and that's what I came up with. So I'm wanting you to know how I came to this conclusion. Next week I would like to be able to present to you a chart and some visual helps that you can look at. And I will also include a list of reference materials which I actually encourage you to look at, especially for those people who have, like me, had this information erroneously but engraved in our minds. So I'm, I want to give you all the tools in case you say, well, I want to see this for myself. And more importantly, and this is probably the more important thing, we'll have to look at the Stone of Destiny, Leofel, the Stone of Destiny, because uh, that begs the question. Now, I am absolutely sure in what I'm saying about this. That stone, obviously we know that it made its way to several different places and ultimately ended up between Scotland and Ireland and ultimately is the what we call the coronation stone that has usually sat under the chair wherever king or queen has been coronated, specifically English kings or queens. So we'll have to address that because the big question then, and I ask you just think about this, and we, we read about these fascinating subjects, the stone of destiny, right? Everybody here heard of the stone of destiny? Yeah? Okay. So I'm not talking foreign language here. But we know that that was apparently the stone that Jacob laid his head upon, if you remember. That stone had to be, uh, I'm going to carry around this stone with me the whole time. Remember they went down to Egypt when there was a famine, and ultimately Jacob, Israel, ends up dying. They take his body back. He wants to be buried in that land. But who do you think kept the stone, it would have been Joseph. And then that stone somehow, somehow, survives the um, years that they are in Egypt's bondage and somehow makes its way eventually. These, these are the mysteries, in my opinion, that need to be examined in great detail because somehow this stone from way back then somehow survives the journey, not just back to the land where Jacob is going to be buried, but then survives the journey. If it, if it went back to Egypt with Joseph, and then what happened to it? And where, how did it end up, A, surviving, not being lost, and then ultimately ends up modern day sitting 
underneath the coronation chair in England. How did that survive? How did that continuity, again, the only explanation that I can say is God's hand in history, God's control over things, even though people say, oh, that can't be. Likewise, when we're going to next week, look at the line of continuation, because there are two things that beg to be answered, two major questions. If, remember, we looked at the Zara line, and that Zara line that basically, we have three generations recorded, these are the descendants of Judah, we have three generations approximately, and then they disappear off the pages of the Bible. We've traced them. We know where they went. We know that they are pre-Egypt, um, pre-Egypt's bondage migration. We know that's why there's no very small three generations recorded. That's it. And we equally know we've traced them all the way to the Malaysian kings. We've traced the line. So we know automatically that through the Zara line, there were kings. Someone was sitting somewhere on a throne, and that line continued. And if we look to the Faraz line, we know without a question, without a doubt, that we know Christ is the terminus. When Christ returns, it basically says for who he, it is his right to rule and reign. It will be him, Shiloh. But in between, you could say, well, does this mean one who's always sitting on the throne of David representative-wise as Christ in heaven sitting on the throne? No. It means somewhere here on earth, and that's what we're going to track down, which means we do have to look at some part of Zedekiah's daughter and whatever union happened amongst the king's line that we actually have a record for. So here are the questions we have much to answer. A, if you're interested, who really was Olam Fola? Two, what happened to the daughters of Zedekiah? What is the fate of Jeremiah the prophet if he is not Olam Fola but Yerabel? Who is Yerabel and why does he matter to us in their records? Next, we might ask, as I just said, how will we know if God's word is true, which it is, but if God's word is true, it says somewhere there is a seed descendant still sitting on the throne today. And I'll tell you what people have done. They've said, well, there was a line, and that line they attribute, by the way, some of you may have heard this decades ago maybe, that the line somehow was connected through a descendant of Solomon to uh, Haile Selassie, and that when King Selassie died, basically the line ended. That cannot be because that would make God's word not true. Now that may be true that there was a Solomon descendant that made that merger that indeed could have resulted in that, but that's not what we're looking at. So the question remains, and I've equally addressed and said over many weeks, look at the late Queen Elizabeth II, but now it remains for us to go back and look, can we substantiate, can we back this up, is there proof? So I'm asking you, if you'll be here next week, I'll provide the answers. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.